combination of subjective input and objective input. What I mean by that is the subjective input is one-on-one -on -one leader interviews. I'll do 100 or more of those each time. There were 132 this time. We chose a lot of other ways to try to get input from as broad a group as possible, particularly some young adults, because uh, what they have to say is really, really important to the future of our community. On the objective side, we put a person on the team by the name of Chrissy Haridas Bollinger. Uh, and Chrissy uh, adds to the IQ level of a room when she walks in. Uh, she would never uh, talk about that herself, but, but I can talk about it. She's the only person I've ever known who, who is a, 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 a graduate from the Kennedy School of Government uh, for graduate degrees in, in econometrics. I'm not even sure I know what it is. And then she was doing international competitiveness research for the U.S. government, for the CIA, for a number of years. She uh, lived here. She was originally a, uh, an engineer out in Oak Ridge before she, she moved into this research focus. And she has come back to this area. So we made her a part of the team. Well, she's, she took the lead on the objective uh, research. And we'll look at some of the objective data, just a small portion of it. Uh, but if you're really interested in, in the details of, 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 of what I'm presenting tonight, you really want to get into that objective data, best practice research uh, uh, nationally and internationally. I would urge you to get a full copy of the report. You can get it online. I'll give you an executive summary at the end of the night tonight. There's a link to how you can get it uh, online. Bottom line, though, it's like a big funnel of taking the subjective and, and objective, the kind of things we're asking the interviews or what are the greatest strengths to build on, what are the greatest obstacles to reaching our full potential as a community, and taking that funnel and coming down to how can we maximize those strengths, how can we minimize those obstacles to get to the most strategic actions to take. So this is truly not a comprehensive plan. It is a strategic plan. It's got a five-year time window. What are the most important things over the next five years, if we really accomplish them, would move this region farthest the fastest. Uh, so that's that's the purpose of it. And so as a philanthropy, we look then behind the scenes as how can we see some of those things to happen. Uh, and that's the way we approach what we do. Uh, when people are asked what, the, what are, the, are the greatest obstacles to reaching our full potential as a community, I want to focus on really two that came out from almost everybody. Aligned leadership and aligned resources. Now, there are a lot of people that said, you know, there are attitudes that hold us back. Frankly, good is good enough Somebody sometimes holds us back. Or we've never done it that way it holds us back. Sometimes, obviously, the national challenges. You've got to remember this was sort of a window in time. I was doing these interviews uh, the last quarter of last year and January of this year. Uh, obviously, the economic environment is a national challenge that affects everybody locally. And then some people talked about specific issues such as sprawl or obesity or homelessness or jobs or crime, but almost everybody talked about uh, the lack of alignment of resources. One of the big conclusions of this report is that we have probably enough resources in this region to do about anything we want to do if we ever got an alignment. Uh, it's the lack of alignment that is really <laughs> the biggest obstacle. Now when people were asked what are the greatest strengths to build on to reach our full potential as a community or region, it was like turning on a waterfall. Uh, you know, I had somebody talk to me today, I, I, I moved away and couldn't wait to get back. What a great place to raise kids, uh, the beauty of the area. So, so these are just some quotes, you know, just uh, give you a flavor of, of the kinds of things that people were just so positive about in terms of, of the strengths of this area. But one of the things continued to sort of stick out. A lot of folks said we've got a foot in two worlds. We've got the best of both worlds. And so we started to analyze that a little bit and see what they were talking about. Well, in terms of people, I love this quote from, from Jimmy Duncan, and, and fair, it's a great example of this, I think. You know, Jimmy says, I represent 750,000 people and half of them moved here from someplace else. And the people who moved here from someplace else dramatically changed the leadership, they dra dramatically changed the culture, and they dramatically changed the optimism of the area. Somebody's moved here from Winston-Salem, you know, they bring ideas from 
Winston-Salem. And so why can't we do that here? So the bottom line is that we are, we are a place of traditional values, but we're not a, a sort of static southern city. We're, we're a place that, as far as our people, we've got a foot in two worlds. In terms of our geography and size, a lot of people said, well, we're a little big city. You know, we got the urban problems, but somehow they seem solvable. We are a southern city, but we've got that Four Seasons quality of life. We are in a mountainous region, but really we're not a mountain city. We're a river city in a mountainous region. So there was a merging theme of foot, foot and two worlds there. Culture and activities. It's folk art to fine art and old harp singing to opera and storytelling to symphony and rafting to farmer's markets and biking the loop to running the tea. You know, the bottom line is we've got a foot in two worlds here that's pretty unique in terms of our culture and activities. And economically, we've got a foot in two worlds. One of the reasons that we don't just go hit the bottom during a recession is it's not one dominant industry here, uh, but it's tourism to technology and everything in between. A foot in two worlds that way. Uh, so coming out of the subjective input, we, we wanted to test something because if we've got this foot in two worlds, and some people are saying, this is the best of both worlds, what were they really saying about that? It was 15 years ago, the sound bite coming out of this research would have been, we're a great place to raise a family, but we're losing our best and brightest. I heard something completely different this time in those interviews. We're a great place to raise a family, and increasingly young people are wanting to come here, stay here, and grow their careers here. So the, the best of both worlds would be to be both a great place to raise a family and a great place to grow a career. So I turned it over to Chrissy Haridas Bollinger, and she tested that theory. Do we have that potential from an objective standpoint? Well. There are, uh, were 11 studies over the last year on great places to build a career. And across those 11 studies, they had some common elements that they, they looked at. The cities mostly in green from Austin to Washington, D.C. were the cities that rated highest in those studies pretty consistently. And the top 10 of those studies repeated, repeatedly. The cities that mostly in red, Los Angeles, the West Palm Beach, Boca Raton, rated in the bottom 10 of those studies pretty consistently. So we compared Knoxville on the exact same criteria, and Knoxville looked much more like the top tier than the bottom tier. Did the same thing on red places. Let's see if I can. on great places to raise a family. There were 16 different studies over the last year on great places to raise a family. There were common elements between those 16 studies. We compared the ratings of the top tier cities, the ones that were consistently showing up in the top 10, uh, and then we compared that to the cities that were consistently showing up in the bottom 10, and then compared Knoxville to that criteria. Knox will look pretty darn good on both of those things. Now I'm going to test you real quick. How many cities were on both of the top tier of those lists? How many? Two? Somebody say two? You got it. What were they? Austin? Nope. Raleigh? Huh? Raleigh Durham. To Austin and Raleigh Durham. In other words, Knoxville's profile was much more like Austin and Raleigh Durham than the other cities. In other words, there are great places to grow families, right? Very rarely are those <coughs> great places to grow careers for young people, and vice versa. Silicon Valley is a great place to grow a career. It is not a great place to raise a family. Washington, D.C. is a great place right now to grow a career. I can tell you, having lived there, it is not a great place to raise a family. So being on both of those lists or having the potential to have that best of both worlds 
is relatively unique in America. So Knoxville compares favorably with the, with the successful case study cities. And please understand me, when I'm saying Knoxville here, I'm talking about the city region. Farragut is a key component of that. So we, co we compare favorably with the successful case study cities as both a great place for building a career and a great place for raising a family. And if you really study the criteria on both of those lists, the crossover criteria that was common to both of those lists all had to do with quality job creation. And so anything we could do to further enhance quality job growth would advance both the career and family related goals simultaneously. Now, did anybody notice, I hate to point out a negative thing, but did anybody notice the one area where we were toward the bottom instead of toward the top that was common to both the lists? Violent crime rate. And it shocked the heck out of us to find that out. Because in the, in the interviews, you don't hear anybody talking about the lack of safety in this area. Uh, so from a subjective standpoint, that is not a problem. But Tennessee as a whole, and the South in general, has a much higher violent crime rate than the rest of the country. And that is reflected in the statistics for this area also. Uh, and so uh, our point in this study was, it's not that people feel unsafe necessarily, because it obviously happens in pockets that doesn't really affect the entire community. But if we can get this information over the internet, everybody else can too. Very easy. And so it affects the perception of this place for people who are looking to re relocate here, looking to grow their businesses here. And that perception problem and the reality needs to be dealt with, with as one of the, one of the negatives. Now, when we get to the strategies here, you will not see a strategy on deal with the violent crime rate. What you'll do is see long-term strategies, education, et cetera, that deal with the, 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 the circumstances that lead to violent crime. So that's, that took us to the next stage, which is what then are the most strategic priorities and actions to reach our full potential as a community. We use this criteria to determine these recommendations. First of all, whatever strategy we chose had to simultaneously advance both being a great place to grow jobs and a great place to raise families. Now, understand what I'm saying by that. As I said before, there are things you can do that will increase the ability to grow a family, but may be directly contradictory to be in a great place to grow jobs, and vice versa. Uh, you could level all the mountaintops here to create flat, flat land so that you could attract industry. That would destroy the quality of life on being in a great place to raise family. I use those as examples. So the first criteria is, is that it had to simultaneously advance both, both, not one or the other. Second, it needed to, to build on existing strengths or minimize obstacles. Uh, if you're talking about the most strategic actions, there are a lot of good things you can do. What are the few great things you can do? And thirdly, it needed to be timely. As I said, our window in time is looking at the next five years. There's something going on right this minute or about to go on that if you maximize its potential, really can move these things, uh, as I say, farther, faster. There were four themes of priorities that emerged. Uh, first and foremost, educational excellence. Uh, second is economic vitality. Third, civic vitality and leadership alignment. I will stop and do a commercial here because as I said, uh, The issues related to quality job growth kind of trump everything right now. And if, if, uh, if you want to read one simple book, the easiest read that I've ever seen on why focusing on quality job growth, quality sustainable job growth is crucial, I would urge you to read The Coming Jobs War by Jim Clifton. 
Jim Clifton is the chairman and CEO of the Gallup Polling Organization. And they've been doing very sophisticated world polling since 2004. Uh, what they concluded was that now that we're in a flat world where work can be done from any place just in time to any place else. There are now three billion people in the world who desperately want and need a good job. There are 1.2 billion good jobs. So what that means is anything that can be done cheaper someplace else will be done cheaper someplace else. So all of Clifton's book is what is the role for America in that coming job war. And, and he answers it by saying there are jobs at the top end in solving the world's next great problems and all the, the ancillary jobs to that. In other words, require four-year college, ongoing degrees, lifelong education, because we've still got the best university system in the world, we've got the best organized venture capital and banking system in the world, we've still got that potential. Big problem. We don't have the best K through 12 education system in the world. So we've got to do something to take advantage of that. The jobs that are vocations, that are location specific, and we'll get more into that in a second, is an opportunity. But the jobs in the middle, everything that can be done cheaper someplace else because it's not location specific, eventually will be done cheaper someplace else. So it's very important that we understand what our opportunities are uh, in relationship to this coming jobs war. So this quote here uh, really underlies all four of these things. The war for good jobs has trumped all other leadership activities because it, because it has been the cause and effect of everything else that countries have experienced. If countries fail at creating jobs, their societies will fall apart. Countries, and more specifically cities, will experience suffering experience suffering, instability, chaos, and eventually revolution. Now another key finding from, from Gallup's research is this. It is moving so fast that the solutions cannot be handled fast enough at, each, at a national level or a state level. In the coming jobs war, the winners will be city by city. So it's at the city region level where you have to align your resources to take full advantage of your opportunities to be able to compete with the city that's coming down for. Makes sense, doesn't it? Even in America, there's going to be the Detroits that are losers in the coming jobs war and the Austins that are winners. I want Knoxville to be a winner. I want this area to be a winner. So what are the most strategic actions to take to reach our full potential as a community? In education, there are three. We've got to focus on globally competitive schools. So our K through 12 system uh, is a problem in America right now. It's actually uh, one of the things that's keeping us from competing well in this, in this uh, coming jobs war. Thankfully, in this particular area, uh, we have some positive things going on. The state of Tennessee has, has made dramatic improvement on on upping the standards to be world-class standards. That's the reason they won race to the top. They were, you know, uh, you sort of get tired of being 46 or 47 or 48 in the nation on education. It's nice for once. We recognize this first in the nation in terms of rate of change. That's the reason Tennessee got raised to the top. We have a very, very good school superintendent here. We've got a strong partnership with the private sector here. We've got to go from good to great, though. Good is not good enough in this coming, job, coming jobs war. So, in the next five years, we've got to put a huge emphasis on birth to kindergarten, making sure that kids are ready for lifelong learning. We've got to put a huge emphasis on teacher quality, and we've got to use the schools themselves as a way to align the community resources. I'll come back to that one in a little while. Why is this so important? Uh, great quote from that used to be us, how America fell behind in the world it invented and how it can come back by Thomas Friedman. This is not your grandparents' labor market anymore. America needs to, to close two education gaps at the same time. 
there is we need to lift the bottom faster and the top higher. Uh, and Arne Duncan, the current Secretary of Education, saying says being average in reading and science and below average in math internationally is not good enough in this new world. Uh, this is the latest international comparisons. A lot of people like to look at these comparisons and say these are comparing U.S. to the other industrialized countries and they're not comparing apples and oranges because the other countries don't <coughs> have universal education. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce debunked that within the last several years and said, no, this is comparing apples and apples. In the U.S. now, we're in the lower group in math among the industrialized countries. We're in the middle group in reading, and we're in the middle lower in science. So we have to lift the, the top higher. And so you'll see um, constant emphasis over ratcheting up the standards. The second priority in education is universities are crucial. And if we really have a chance to be a top 25 public research university, it should not be just lip service. Making UT the best it can be by recruiting world-class research faculty and recruiting top black graduate students and transforming that campus so it's an attractor is important. And those are the actions in the next five years that are, are the priorities. Clifton says it this way in the coming jobs where there are three key en energy sources of job creation in America. The top cities, the top universities, and the top leaders in those cities. And Richard Florida says it this way, major research universities are the hubs of the creative economy. They are a basic infrastructure component, more important than the canals, railroads, and freeway systems of past epics and a huge source of competitive advantage. The third priority in education is on this other end, we've got to identify the location-specific vocations. If you want an HVAC installed, you're not going to get it installed from China. I had a gas problem in my house. With the pilot light wouldn't, wouldn't light. I can't call somebody from in, India to, to, to repair that pilot light. You know, those are good jobs. And yet, we've given up on vocational education in this country. It became a bad word. There are certificate programs that provide welders that will get a job in a heartbeat at Y-12 right now. Tell me where the welding programs are enough to supply the aging need. You're out in Oak Ridge. There's an aging population out there. So, we need to have a region, location, specific, vocational plan. In other words, identify what are those location, specific vocations that are going to be the future in this region. What are the current certificate programs to meet that need? And then any that don't already exist, we've got a new opportunity. That's put them on a new vocational campus. Fellowship State just acquired the Phillips Magnavox uh, former North American World Headquarters site out uh, Strawberry Plains Pike, far into the county. Uh, 221,000 square feet under roof with plenty of space around. And if you go out and look at that, it's high base space, it's classroom space, it's middle base space. There's not a single vocational program that you couldn't locate out there if you know what you need to locate out there. That's a huge opportunity. And the reason you need to focus on this is many of the good jobs, we've been saying college, 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 college. But many of the good jobs do not require four years of college. They require the same level of reading and math skills sometimes at K through 12, but they don't require four years of college. It's vital that high schools and community college offers vigorous vocational tracks and that we treat them with the same esteem as we do liberal arts or college tracks. This is just a starting list of location specific vocations. Most every one of those requires some sort of certificate program that may or may not exist in this region today.
So those were the education priorities. We now join, uh, go to the uh, economic vitality priorities. This one says claim clean energy capital. Claim the title and realize the potential. Um, let me jump to why first. A lot of the best researchers in the world believe that clean energy, uh, shorthand that is ET, is going to become the successor to information technology as the next world's growth industry. Uh, a country with a thriving ET industry will enjoy energy security, will enhance its own national security, will contribute to global security, and if Silicon Valley was the center of the IT revolution, the places who can take advantage of the ET revolution will establish wealth creation and jobs. We were named last year the number one metro area in green jobs growth per capita by the Brookings Institution. We were named number two metro area in green jobs per capita. That kind of shocked me. How many of y'all knew that? Some of you did. And it shocked me that the Brookings Institute, very, very uh, powerful research institution, recognizes that way. The Milken Institute's best performing cities index um, indicated that the Innovation Valley area has a growing reputation as a clean tech research hub. And there's a guy named Mike Howard. Does anybody in here know Mike? president of an organization called the Electric Power Research Institute. Uh, shorthand is EFRI. Now, how many of you have heard of EFRI? Not many. EFRI has three offices in America. Palo Alto, California, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Knoxville, Tennessee. Mike Howard, the president of EFRI, is located here. They don't distinguish between any of those three offices as their corporate headquarters, but he's located here, and a significant number of, of researchers are here. They are the research and development arm for the major utilities in America. In other words, they're on the cutting edge of energy research in America right now. Mike Howard says it this way. For those of you who are business people, Think about this in terms of market share now. There are two billion people in the world who do not have electricity, but want it. The other five billion need cleaner, more efficient, and more sustainable sources. This area, Knoxville, Oak Ridge, Farragut, he says, has more core assets than any other place he's aware of in America to build an ET industry cluster. And we have a huge opportunity to make a global difference. So we go back. Right now, UT is taking the lead with the help of Oak Ridge National Laboratory in developing a very visible research park at Cherokee Farms. How many of y'all have seen that as you go down the Alcoa Highway? Well, that could be just a general research park, or it could be a research park that was very intentional about trying to co-locate these energy technology research assets together and plant the flag at Cherokee Farms and say, we're going to be at the energy capital of America, clean energy capital of America. We think that's a big idea. So you assemble and recruit the clean energy research talent, and then you build the bugs. So what does that mean? Remember I told you that Mike Howard has offices in Palo Alto, California, right in the center of the Silicon Valley. He says, you know where the deals are made in, in the Silicon Valley? They're not done at the big corporate headquarters, et cetera. They're done at the dime, at Buck's Dime. A third place that people, where the researchers, the venture capital, and the entrepreneurs get together and the ideas are shared. Right in the middle of Cherokee Farms, you need to have that kind of networking place, uh, that kind of diner, that kind of place where people meet over the water cooler and the folks who can't build businesses but understand the research and the people who can't uh, 
uh, do the research, but can finance the businesses are all located together. Now, so the question becomes, do we really have these clean energy research assets or not? And if you ask the questions and go to the right places, the list is substantial. We've got people in this region right now working on next generation nuclear. Ways to build nuclear reactors in a factory and ship to the site for one-tenth the cost, one-tenth the time, and one-tenth the regulatory hassle. Nuclear is going to be part of the solution worldwide. But it's probably not going to be part of the solution the way it's built now. It's going to be this new generation. There are folks working on next generation solar. And these are, these are not just Oak Ridge National Lab scientists and UT scientists. These are private sector folks. The, the state under Bredesen made a huge priority of, of recruiting Sharp and Bonker and Hemlock to this state. So there are private sector folks working on next generation solar that are in this region or, or right next to this region. There are, there's huge research going on in next generation <coughs> materials because of, of the spallation neutron mm -hmm. source. Carbon fiber right now is going to replace steel and iron as the, the uh, material of choice because it's lighter, stronger, and more energy efficient. It started off at 20 times the cost of steel or iron. It's now down to four times the cost of steel and iron. Once it comes down even farther, it will replace it. Now the question for me is things that have been commercialized out of Oak Ridge in the past, the entire nuclear medicine industry, for example, where are those corporate headquarters in this region? So if carbon fiber is going to become the, the material of choice because of its energy properties, its strength properties, it can be commercialized here or any place else in the world. What are we doing right now to make sure it's commercialized here? That's, that's the point. How do you build these businesses here out of this research competency? Um, tell you the story. Al Gore invented the internet, right? Everybody in here agrees with that. Al Gore did not invent the internet, but Al Gore did something fairly substantial because the internet was invented, think about Oak Ridge now, the internet was invented by Vincent Cerf and his Department of Defense Research Agency team out in the Palo Alto area, the Silicon Valley area, before it was the Silicon Valley area. And Vincent Cerf and his team did not think it had any commercial application whatsoever. <coughs> what Al Gore did was because some of the entrepreneurs in that area started to believe that it might have some commercial application, he passed the law to allow the research, the governmental research, to be shared with those private sector entrepreneurs. And thus, the IT revolution, which drove much of America's GDP growth over the last 20 or 30 years, centered out of that area. So this, this concept of connecting the research with the entrepreneurs, with the capital, is crucial. And it can occur anywhere, but how can we, how can we be intentional about trying to make it occur here? Well, if you co-locate those things at Cherokee Farm, you have a better potential. This is a starting list of UT, ORNL, private sector, every other research, uh, researchers that have a connection to this region already that are in some way involved in clean energy research. We're suggesting there be a very intentional development pattern at Cherokee Farm that co-locates co those things together. Because the research is very clear that when you co-locate together, it is not the silos that creates jobs in your area. It's the government research, university research, and private sector research, and private sector companies co-locating together where you build clusters of jobs. Now, this was the strategy that was used by, I'm going to ask you to, to uh, guess a city to become a technology hotspot outside of the Silicon Valley. Austin, Texas. 
It was number one on both of those lists, wasn't it? And it was a guy named George Kosmetsky who came here from Austin, Texas in the mid-1990s. Anybody meet him? Anybody remember the name? Anybody remember the 21st Century Jobs Initiative about 1995? Now here's what was going on then. There was a belief that the huge federal research dollars to the Oak Ridge complex were going to go away. So the Department of Energy funded a thing called the 21st Century Jobs Initiative. Very well funded, very well done. It was a planning effort. And uh, the, the team that was brought in was DRI the Raw Hill from San Francisco, California, and George Kosmetsky, who was credited with being the architect of the plan that led to Austin becoming a tech, technology superstar. And here's what Kosmetsky said in 1995. You guys are starting with more core assets than we ever started with. Because we had the University of Texas, which was pretty substantial. But you've got the University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is a lot more substantial. Now, fast forward. The plan that was done in 1995 was put on a shelf and was not implemented in major ways. There wasn't an intentionality of implementation. Like so many plans, good plan, put on a shelf. Uh, not only did Oak Ridge not go away, but it's become the best energy laboratory in the world. It's been totally revitalized since that time. UT is getting better. And so if we had great assets in 1995, we've got even better assets right now. The question is, are we going to put plans on the shelf anymore? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to fight in the coming jobs? Uh, there are other clusters, not just uh, energy technology. We've got a pretty substantial cluster to build on in media production. We've got a pretty substantial cluster to build on in radiological science. We have to pay attention to these clusters and not just try to be all things to all people. You know, the way you build clusters is, is you get <laughs> the leaders of these organizations in a room together and say, what can we do together to recruit more to this cluster or to build jobs out of this cluster? We're the third largest media production center in the U.S. And in radiological science, uh, probably the poster child here was CTI that, was, that came out of Oak Ridge National Lab, sold to Siemens for a billion dollars, but there's a lot more resources there. The current one that's, uh, that's coming up is uh, Proton Therapy Center and a potential for actually manufacturing the Proton Therapy facilities, which is uh, a, a new way for cancer detection here. The same entrepreneurs who are behind CTI are behind ProNova, which is trying to do that. So this is a growing cluster. The point is be intentional about growing businesses for this coming jobs world. And we have to become one of the best places, if not the best place in the country to start businesses. Uh, this is one of the poster children for do we have enough resources we started off uh, trying to figure out, well, how, how do we become a more entrepreneurial economy? How do we support business creation here? And we found uh, that there's not a lack of programs. There's 50 different organizations, or 50 different programs in the region that's focused on entrepreneurial support. The problem is there's no front door or connection to that system. So one organization does one thing, and somebody else does something else, somebody else does something else, but it's not a connected system. They're in silos. So we've got to connect the entrepreneurial support system with a memorable brand and easy front doors, and there's an effort underway to do that. The reason this is so important is you don't recruit uh, a 5,000 worker factory anymore. Uh, you gotta do it yourself. You gotta, have 100 people starting companies that employ 25 people each, 20 people starting companies that employ 50 each, and 5 people starting companies that employ 300 each. So that's uh, economic vitality. The three priorities in civic vitality, this one's already launched, and it's very exciting. Uh, if you haven't been to the new Outdoor Knoxville Adventure Center at uh, Volunteer Landing, you ought to go. Uh, 
this is the outdoor Knoxville priorities. That is to position East Tennessee with Knoxville as a hub as a premier destination for the 32 million people in the United States who annually participate in outdoor and adventure tourism. The, the initiative has been launched. Now the focus is on improving the trails and the assets. Uh, and the long range uh, exciting project that's being worked on is an obstacle to the Smokies Bike Trail. Uh, this feasibility study said, you know, one of the competitive advantages that Knoxville have, has in this regard is you've got to put in two worlds. You can be uh, kayaking the rivers during the day, you can be uh, uh, eating on Market Square at night. National Geographic sort of talked about the split in two worlds when they launched a geotourism website for this region and called it where rivers and mountains meet. Second priority in civic vitality is, uh, is really enhancing the creative arts, music, culture, and entertainment of this area. I'm a person who used to think the arts was a nice thing to do. Uh, I've been convinced by this research that it's a crucial thing to do. Creative people are the drivers of the new economy. Creative people are attracted to places with creative environments. So we need to become more intentional about uh, supporting the arts through a United Fund for the Arts. There's been a, uh, a new effort to develop an arts and heritage fund. Uh, that fund needs to expand dramatically to become like a United Way for the Arts. We need to have a broad base of support from many for the arts rather than support from just a few. And there's a current effort underway to take some abandoned warehouses and turn them into live, work, art space, artist communities. Uh, great quote from Richard Florida, access to talented and creative people is to modern business what access to coal and iron ore is to steel make. Uh, the final strategy in uh, civic vitality is we actually started to make a huge difference with downtown revitalization as the heart, healthy part of the entire region when you started quit pulling around the edges and started at Market Square and worked out. We need to continue to work out from that downtown center because if you hadn't seen Cumberland Avenue lately, it looks off. It's not an attractor to a world-class university. But currently, currently, there's almost $500 million worth of capital improvements going on at UT. There is a plan to improve dramatically Cumberland Avenue that will start in the spring of 2014. And there's some major development projects down there. So stay with this focus, particularly downtown to the university being the first priority now. Uh, don't kind of scattergun it around, build off the critical mass. And now, all of this goes back to the biggest obstacle. We only accomplish these things by aligned leadership and aligned resources. And uh, so the last priority is all about developing leadership and aligning resources around priorities that lead to educational excellence, economic vitality, and civic vitality. That means we need servant leaders who don't care about the credit. Uh, it's all about leadership when you get right down to it. I've got an example of both alignment at the regional level, it's important to do in the next five years, and alignment at the neighborhood level that will impact every neighborhood in, in this area. Uh, in fact, it would be one of the best, uh, best uh, to take the lead on something like that. The regional alignment strategy, I go back to this entrepreneurial support system. This is the first time in history that I'm aware of that the entrepreneurial programs have been put on the ground. And if you look at great entrepreneurial support systems in other communities, they have all these elements. We've got all the elements. We've got them in 50 different programs. So we've got to figure out a way to connect those together in a way that makes them an operating system. That's a regional alignment priority. Uh, and we believe the organization that needs to take that on is Innovation Valley Inc. What they did in Austin, Texas was they had somewhat similar situation and that their regional efforts called Opportunity Austin. It's uh, 15 years older than, than Innovation Valley is, almost 20 years older now. 
And what they did was they hired a high-level person to coordinate the entrepreneurial resources that wakes up every day with that as a priority, that's respected by all the resources. So they didn't try to merge them all together. They tried to get them all on the same page doing what they should do well together. Uh, there's an effort underway right now to open up a, a uh, entrepreneurial center in the heart of the region on Market Square with leadership connected to Innovation Valley that would be a unifier for this system. That's an important thing to do at a regional level. The second one is a current initiative that you may have heard a little bit about. It's called Schools as Community Centers. Now, there are 49 elementary school districts in Knox County. And those schools, by and large, are at the center of their neighborhoods. They're considered uh, a central, central uh, a place in, in the neighborhood. What they've done in Cincinnati is they've taken all those elementary school districts citywide and put a community resource coordinator in each of those schools that is the equal to the school principal. The community resource coordinator is there to align all the resources for that neighborhood, churches, healthcare institutions, uh, crime prevention people, community development people, uh, youth organizations, etc. All the kinds of, of circles that you see around this center for two purposes. They're aligned to help the school be successful, to impact student achievement. But they're also aligned to create a healthier neighborhood because the drug house down the street impacts both the neighborhood and the school. The crime problem, the violent crime problem in that neighborhood impacts the neighborhood and the school. So in Cincinnati now, they're able to tell you whether or not they're missing any resources because they're aligned <coughs> at the neighborhood level. There's currently a plan to develop to roll this out to all 49 schools in Knox County in the next six years, starting next year. Not just the low-income schools, every school, every neighborhood school. Now, at the middle school and high school level, if you're using the neighborhood schools, elementary schools as the alignment mechanism, the middle and high school community schools initiative is much more about college and career access. So there is a model for that, but the neighborhood, the neighborhood approach uh, is at the elementary school level because those schools really do not have overlapping contiguous <coughs> districts. That's a priority that we think ought to be implemented over the next six years. So there were 10 different uh, areas of, of actions that came out of this research. Educational excellence, three in that, globally competitive K-12 schools, UT is a top 25 public research university, and, and uh, developing a vigorous vocational campus. Economic vitality, plant, plant and claim, clean energy capital, also take advantage of two additional clusters over the next five years, the media production cluster and the radiological science cluster, and become the best place in the country to build businesses. Civic vitality, uh, launch and improve the outdoor Knoxville strategy, really focus on building the strength and funding base of the creative community, and keep focusing on going out from downtown, particularly to the university, and then leadership development resource alignment. I'll close with a couple of quotes, or really one quote, again from the coming jobs board. Jim Clifton says, fixing America's biggest problems and reinventing the world can only be done one city at a time. Ultimately, all solutions are local. Every city has strong, caring leaders working on numerous committees and initiatives to fuel their local growth. The feat these leaders have to pull off is doubling their entrepreneurial energy by aligning all their local forces. They succeed by declaring an all-out war. I don't use the term war lightly. This really has to be a war on job loss, on low workplace energy, on health care costs, on low graduation rates, on brain drain, and on community disengagement. Those things destroy cities. 
destroy job growth and destroy city GDP. Every city requires its own master plan that is as serious as planning for a war. A war. That's bad news. The good news is we're one of those places that can succeed. We just align our leadership and align our resources. Because our full potential is to be both a great place to build a career and a great place to raise a family. I'll be glad to take the question.
Yeah. I've been pondering on this alignment of resources for a long time. <clears throat> Could you sort of flesh that out a little bit, put a little bit of meat on those bones? Um, I, mean, I don't know that I can do much better than I've, than I've tried to do already. I, um, I, I can give a few examples. Um, uh, the current poster child, as I said, is the entrepreneurial support system. Um, you know, people have been saying well, there's lack of early stage seed capital. Well, there's a whole, a whole bunch of resources out there that are focused on early stage seed capital. They're just not connected to the programs who are saying there's a lack of seed capital. You know, it's, it's so so um, there's a real effort there to align. It's, it's important. Um, the, uh, you know, there are, there are business mentors who have moved into this region and are living out in Teleco Plains or living here in Farragut. They've not been connected into, you know, you know uh, Helping help the businesses to uh, to grow here. So so there, that's one example. Another example that just really, uh, frankly, bothers me uh, is uh, we had this had this uh, ten year plan to end chronic homelessness, and we are a very caring and generous community. And yet, what we found when that planning effort was done, what there are multiple organizations competing over the same homeless people and, and doing emergency services, all doing emergency services and counting the same people. Now, a lot of the resources would say, if you've got that kind of passion toward dealing with homelessness, why doesn't one organization focus on emergency services and another organization focus on caseworkers and getting people out of homelessness and another organization focus on something complimentary. And frankly, another untold story was for as long as that 10-year plan was staffed, those organizations were moving in that direction and, and sort of are, are on the same railroad track today. So there was improvement in that area. But uh, uh, there were 650 churches in Knoxville. Uh, a lot of those churches have, have a, a passion for, for doing something for the poor. A lot of them will go down and, and volunteer uh, and serve meals to homes and things like that. Well, in Denver, what they did was they said one church, one homeless family. Ended. You know? So a, a church could actually align resources with the same passion and say, whatever it takes, we're going to get one chronically homeless person off the streets. But we do episodic ministry as much for ourselves as we do for really ending the problem. I mean, those are some examples. Well, I, I, the, this schools as a community center thing, I think, is a breakthrough. I mean, I really do believe. I think what we've got to do is we 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 have. I, I think first of all, nationwide, we're probably like this. I I know more about Knoxville than I knew, do about other places. But I kind of. Uh, like in Knoxville, the dominant culture of Knoxville to the movie Braveheart. My favorite. <laughs> right? And if you remember that movie, Scotch Irish culture, dominant culture here, remember we've got a lot of transplants, but I think we get assimilated into the dominant culture. Dominant culture here is Scotch Irish, is they fought with each other until time of crisis or war. And then they bind it together with each other against the common enemy. Now let me let me use an example. Chattanooga in 1984 had just been named the dirtiest city in America. It was losing its industrial base. It was a smokestack town that was losing a steel industry. They were in crisis. And what they did was an effort similar to Nine Counties One Vision, for those of you who remember, in 2000. But because they were in crisis, they had to do something about it. So the leadership in Chattanooga coming out of Nine Counties One Vision coalesced around one plan to make it happen. They repeated it again in 1994, and by the year 2000, they were named the Comeback City in America. They've got far fewer assets than this region has. Far fewer. And in fact, if you if you talk to leadership down there, one of the reasons they were so successful in binding together out of that crisis, that common enemy, 
was they were sick and tired of people passing through them to go to the 1982 World's Fair in Knoxville. All right? Our problem here is good is good enough. We've never been in that crisis. Good is good enough. And what I'm trying to convince you of is good is good enough is not good enough in a coming jobs war. It is just not. So, somehow, we've got to get over a cultural weakness of good is good enough, everybody do their thing, everybody go different directions. It doesn't matter if we come together and have one common vision, one common plan. It doesn't matter because we're going to be all right. Our, our unemployment rates, you know, going to be okay. we got to get past that and say, we're in a world war here. And we've got some pretty significant assets. We've got world class assets. We've got we've world here. class assets. We got enough here to be the best. That's exactly right. We to do it. That's exactly right. I don't know if you came in that way or not, but thank God you're saying that. <laughs> That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. summary and there's a link to the website it's got the full report. Knoxvilleresearch.com. Uh, so the, the bottom line is that uh, that that, uh, that the alignment issue is the biggest obstacle but there are some very substantial opportunities but we've got to overcome the alignment issue. Other questions?